Okay, so what I'm going to do now is 10 minutes, summarize everything for the people that weren't here last week, summarize everything. So last week I talked about innate versus adaptive immunity, and I described the main difference between them as the evolution model. So innate is evolutionarily more old. That means that basically all organisms contain to some extent an innate system, while only more recent organisms contain an adaptive system. Okay? So even plants contain an innate system. If you think about it, they have leaves and all of that. It's you know it's covered in wax, which protects like um, I don't know plant viruses from getting in stuff like that. Innate non-specialized exists in literally all organisms to some extent. Okay, adaptive is much more specialized, and the link between the innate and adaptive immune system is the dendritic cells and the T cells. So the dendritic cell is a type of macro, it's a specialized type of macrophage, and it's an innate cell, obviously. And what it does is it allows activation of T cells. So that's a link between innate and adaptive. And then the T cell in reverse will now go on and activate immune cells, innate cells such as the macrophage. So that's the link between them. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. I then talked a little bit about acute <laughs> inflammation. So with acute inflammation, you have the skin and the underlying blood vessel. So I said, let's say you get a mosquito bite, that causes injury and damage. Injury and damage basically means release of chemicals, and those chemicals are detected by like skin macrophages or other innate cells that are underneath the skin. So let's say this is a skin macrophage. That macrophage then goes on to produce certain cytokines. And that basically, those cytokines, inflammatory mediators, all of that stuff acts on the underlying blood vessels. And basically what it does is it causes this vessel to vasodilate and become more vascularly permeable. So it increases the fenestrations in the endothelial membrane. A lot of fluid passes out. That fluid is called an exudate fluid because it contains proteins like antibodies, white cells, stuff like that. So it passes out through the fenestrations into the area of injury. You get antibodies fighting the infection and all of that stuff happening. Okay? You get an excess in fluid here. So basically, this area swells. Well, this area. <laughs> but, um, okay, that area swells up. And as you know, a mosquito bite, you get swelling, you get redness, itchiness, all of that stuff. That's all related to the inflammation process. So you get the swelling. What happens then is you have an excess of exudate fluid. So it has to go somewhere. So it goes by the lymphatic system. So this is the lymphatic system. It all drains into the lymphatic system. The first cells to a site of inflammation are the innate cells. So the first one is neutrophils. They predominate for about 24 hours. After that, you have the macrophages killing in, coming in and killing everything that the, the neutrophils do. <coughs> Again, if the innate system fails, if it can't manage an infection, then you get this drainage, and the drainage goes into a lymph node. And as you know, the lymph node contains tons and tons of T cells and B cells and everything. So these T cells in here will get activated the T cells then home back to the site of infection and they cause a Th1, Th2 response and all of that. Does uh, everyone remember say, that? What did you say the fluid was called? The what, sorry? Exodate what? Exodate fluid. Okay, so um, you have two types of fluid. You have transidate and you have exudate. Transidate you should have heard of. Transidate is basically um, when you get a, um, a capillary bed, for example, you have an arterial end, you have the actual capillary bed, okay, and then you have a venous end. So you should know at the arterial end you've got a high hydrostatic pressure, so you're getting a lot of fluid passing out. Have you done this before? Somewhere, yeah, okay, good. A lot of fluid passing out, and then that fluid returns by osmotic pressure on the venous end. If I confused you, are you okay? Do you recognize that, yeah? That fluid that comes out and then usually gets drained back in, it doesn't contain any protein. Okay. Okay, so there's no protein in there because proteins are too big to pass out. Right? So that's called transidate fluid. That's a normal thing. You get that everywhere. Okay? 
So if you remember, the transivate fluid passes out, most of it drains back, whatever can't <laughs> drain back goes into the lymphatic system, and it eventually returns back into the blood circulation through the ducts in your neck, for example. Everyone recognize that. I'm not sure we could talk that to you, but you should have. Yeah. You haven't done it anywhere. Okay, um, so there's, there's no lecture, but you, you did it in A-levels, right? Somewhere. I did, but not those words. Okay, no, that's the more complicated. I swear you should have had a lecture by Patricia Rivesi. Okay, <laughs> doesn't matter. Do you understand the principle? All you need to know in this, if you haven't done it before, all you need to learn from it is that at the arterial end you have a high hydrostatic pressure so you have a high blood pressure at the venous end you have a lower blood pressure <coughs> therefore at the arterial end you're forcing fluid out and the venous end there's only osmotic pressure osmotic pressure is within the capillary so you're bringing things back in okay so if fluid is leaking out at the arterial end it ends up here which is the extracellular area, the extra sort of it's outside the extravascular area. Okay, most of it drains back in via osmotic pressure. If it doesn't drain back, it goes into the lymphatic system, and then the lymphatic you should know that the lymphatic system eventually drains back into do you know what that duct's called? Yes. The thoracic duct. Exactly in the neck. So eventually this lymphatic system goes all over the body, drains back into the neck. Okay, and then it returns back to the venous circulation. Does that make sense to everyone? That's literally the fundamental of everything. Yeah. So you've heard of Starling's law, but you're not or Starling's fucking law. Um, <laughs> they're teaching you now. Um, I think they're presuming that because most of you are postgraduates that you should know something. Right. But you need to know this because this is this was taught to us literally in like the first two weeks and they made a massive deal about this. If you don't understand this, there's no way you can understand immunology because immunology is all about the lymphatic system, a lot of drainage coming out. Why else would there be inflammation? Why why else would there be a swelling unless this pro this process was actually happening? Okay, you understand this process, which is fantastic. The fluid in the extravascular space is called transidate fluid. The difference between transidate, which is a normal fluid, and exudate, which is abnormal, is exudate occurs in pathology, exudate contains protein. And the reason that exudate contains protein is because this blood vessel, this blood capillary, for example, I said has increased vascular permeability. What did I say caused that increased vascular permeability? Vasodilation. Vasodilation and increased vascular permeability is because of mediators. inflammatory mediators, exactly. And you mentioned them in the lecture, you did say what they were, which is fantastic. But um, <laughs> histamine, prostaglandin, <laughs> leukotriene. Dan mentioned it yesterday. Okay? Histamine, leukotriene, prostaglandin causes these vessels to become ginormous and for these menstruations to increase. So if this is becoming really big, there's more blood, there's more blood moving out. If the, if the size of the fenestration, which are the little pores between endothelial cells, is becoming bigger, more fluid can pass out. Because it's becoming bigger, right, proteins can pass out too. Because proteins, which are usually quite big structures, they can now pass out through these bigger holes. Okay, and that causes exudate fluid. Okay? Everyone clear about that? That is sort of the fundamental of inflammation. That's what inflammation is all about. They've asked, if you look at EMQs, past EMQs, a lot of them ask, um, there, there's an SAQ question in my year. Yeah, sorry. Is the fluid the same as like interstitial fluid? Similar, right? Inter interstitial fluid is more transidate, so it doesn't contain proteins. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay? okay. Exudate is only in pathology. So only when something screws itself up, then proteins will leak out. And what, what proteins am I talking about? Antibodies, most important. And cells, cells contain proteins, so I'm classifying them as proteins. Cells, leukocytes, pass out. And you should also know about it because, although I didn't attend it today, but Andy talked about leukocyte extravasation. So when leukocytes move out from things, and he talked about rolling, tethering, all of that bullshit, 
and how they move out. This is how they move out. This is the fundamental of how they move out. Is everyone clear? If you're not, ask me now because I'm going to go on. Okay, good. Okay, so that's inflammation. I said that, tell me, is inflammation, so if a mosquito bites the skin and you get this <coughs> big swelling, it's red, it itches, is that good or bad? Good. Why is it good? Because you know the white blood cells are getting into the site. True. But the main reason that it's a good thing is because inflammation localizes, okay, really important, it localizes the infection to the area that it's in. So if you get a mosquito bite, you're not going to end up getting like a big swelling on your ass or something if it's on your hand, right? It stays in that area. It stops the organism, it stops the pathogen from moving elsewhere in your body. That's why it's really, really important. Okay? Um, and I said inflammation, you know if something's inflamed, a lot, of, oh, pretty much 90% of diseases have some form of inflammation. You know if it's inflamed because you get itis at the end of the word. Okay? So literally, anything with the word itis <coughs> at the end, pleuritis, alveolitis, whatever, means inflammation. Hi, can I help you? Are we allowed to come in to see? Yeah, if you want. Yes, yeah, so we told you. Yeah. Told you. We told you. Yeah, come in. Make yourself at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> okay. Um, right, anyway. Okay, guys. Anything with itis at the end means inflammation, right? Just like pruritus, alveolitis, meningitis, inflammation of the meninges, so on and so forth. Okay, that's inflammation. It's a good thing because it localizes stuff. What happens if you can't localize into an area? If you can't localize the organism into an area, you get a fever. That's what fever is. It's generalized inflammation. Okay. It's basically TH1 versus TH2 responses. Like, so it's a localization by the mastodon. Exactly. Right, exactly. The TH1 localizes TH2. I'm going to come on to that in a bit. Okay, but you're absolutely right. Okay. So your friend's absolutely right. You talked about the TH1 response. <coughs> Remember, TH1 is macrophages. Macrophages are one of the, the first molecules after neutrophils that come onto the site of inflammation, therefore they localize stuff, right? If the macrophages can't handle it, then the B cells come on. Yeah, the B cells get their kick at it, and they'll, they'll screw everything up because they'll cause antibodies to come everywhere in the body and you'll get generalized inflammation, you'll get a fever. Does that make sense? Good. So I've summarized from last week's lecture innate versus adaptive, acute inflammation, B cells, okay? Last week I talked a lot about what, you're gonna, what we're gonna do again today just to get it in your head. CD4s and B cells, the helper system, all of that. The B cells on their own, I just want you to remember that there's two types of lymphocytes in the adaptive system, there's two types of lymphocytes, there's T and there's B. Difference between them, both of them are produced in the bone marrow, but only the, T cell, uh, only the B cells mature in the bone marrow. The T cells mature in the thymus, right? That all happens pre-puberty, uh, pre and then basically what happens is the thymus atrophies, and it doesn't have any function after that, right? Okay, B cell is important because the B cell receptor, the cell surface receptor on a B cell is the antibody. And as I said last week, there's five types of antibody. <laughs> okay, IgG, MAED, I told you to remember them in that order because that's the, that's the order of importance. G is like, it's wicked, it's like the best antibody. D is crap, he doesn't even mention it in his lecture because it's such a, okay. Gay men always enter dorsally, <laughs> which is also true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay. Anyway, moving on. That's 
I almost summarized everything from last week. I'm not going to talk about the genetics. You should know that by now. There's three types of genetics, combinatorial, uh, junctional, and um, somatic mutations, right? Combinatorial is the one that teaches you in a lot of detail. So expect something in the exam. Expect an SAQ asking, I don't know, describe the process of somatic recombination. And you want to talk about how there's loads, there's multi genes, okay, for each type of HLA, and then they all mix together. So you pick each part, and that forms a variable region. That's why there's so much diversity. 